Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Art of War podcast. I'm your host, Nick Nandavati, and this week we are blessed by the golden gods themselves. <laughs> they have stormed through the inferno gateways of Wraith Knights, OT Cannons, and Imperial Knights towering over everything. The Golden Boys have gotten not only first, but second place at the Games Workshop US Open in Tacoma, the largest 10th edition Super Major to date. And we are here joined by Steve Trimble, the winner of the event with his custody. Steve, how are you doing? I'm great, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. Steve has been a menace with custodies for years and years past, so <laughs> it's no joke when I tell you he knows what he's doing with this. Additionally, it's no surprise either to see him doing so well when the army is on t in top form. We're going to unpack exactly what makes custodies work and what makes Steve work. This is a two-part show. In the first episode, which we are about to embark upon, we're going to get to know Steve, where he came from, his play style, his philosophy and approach to 40K. What makes a winner? We're going to learn about Steve Trimble, ultimately concluding in what the list he actually took to Tacoma was. Then in part two, this is going to be for subscribers only. You can subscribe on AOW40K.com. It's $5.95 a month. You get access to the part twos of all of our episodes. This is our 199th episode, so you get tons of value. We've been doing this forever, and you know what? It's got all the good stuff in it. So in that episode, we're going to unpack exactly how this custodies list works, how he moves it around the table, what goes in reserves, why the choices he makes. We're going to learn that why's in the house, exactly how to do it. Additionally, you'll get access to our amazing Discord community, which is popping with 10th edition knowledge. All right, Steve, are you ready to do this? Yeah, Nick. Let's do it. I am super excited. Tell me about how you got into Warhammer. All right, so I got in at Warhammer at the very end of 7th edition with the, the little Dark Angels versus CSM starter set. Uh, but I quickly switched to Tau, like at the beginning of 8th edition with indexes. Because uh, I just love the uh, the aesthetic, like a bunch of crisis suits and riptides and all that stuff. Riptides were terrible in the index, so I was a little sad, so I took a back burner. Uh, and then I just was relatively casual until like... Till essentially the Tau Codex came out, and then I started playing with a bunch of Riptides because they were good again, Commanders, and a crap ton of drones. And actually, that style of playstyle is something I really like now, which is just the most durable army possible. Because that list was, as everyone knows, was essentially like six models that did anything. You had three Commanders, three Riptides, and a crap ton of drones. So it was really hard to actually kill the effective pieces. And I, I still. List. Yeah, everyone did. I personally not a fan of current Tau. I don't like just like suicide units, but I love that old list. I know I'm weird. Most people hate it, um, but I love that style of army. It's what I've always played and what I still play. Like uh, I played Leviathan Tyranids with a bunch of warriors. I played sadly Death Guard all last year. I played. I'm playing. I've always played Custodes. I just love durable infantry models that are really hard to kill. That's awesome. How did you identify that style? It sounds like you're very sure of yourself. Like, I like durable stuff. I like to play tough armies. Um, a lot of people I find don't just know their play style when they get into a game. How did you find that? At the beginning of ninth edition, I'm like, I want to just play the most elite army possible. I want to try that out. So I obviously gravitated to custodies. And then I just fell in love instantly. I'm like, I got 30 dudes. They're insanely hard to kill. They were okay damaging in ninth edition, not nearly as much as they are now, but it was just all around. I loved it because I could have, I love to deploy in the line and run at my opponent, minimal gun as possible if I can run it. And it just, it, I just fell in love instantly. And then I just gravitated all through ninth edition to armies like that, like I said, Leviathan Tyranids and Death Guard and all that crap. Okay, so you you make it sound so simple and burgish, but I know there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Deploying on the line and running at your opponent as a viable strategy. That has got to be, like, I mean, point and click in one right way of looking at it, but also your opponent can just shoot you. They can just mm -hmm. charge you. I get you're durable, but, like, 40K is a lethal game. Mm -hmm. How do you build a list to, like, deal with this stuff? What's your approach there? Yeah, yeah, speaking of that, like... I know people meme on that play style. It's, it's understandable. It's easy to meme on. But it is actually relatively hard to play because you are essentially playing with no guns in a edition where guns are very prevalent. So you got to... It's all about the movement phase. It's really important. But uh, list yeah, design, though... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> list design, though, uh, especially with current custodies, uh, I gravitated 
just, I've tried every data sheet multiple times, like um, Warden, Zolaris, Kalidus Tanks, all that jazz. And I just, uh, I'm gravitating toward the most cost efficient per everything. So movement, damage, durability unit possible. And that's what got me to the max amount of guard because it's the highest damaging unit in the codex. Uh, you can have multiple wounds like Alaris. So you can take shield, so you can have four wounds. So you're good there. Uh, they have, they're very efficient at shooting with their double shooting reroll wounds. It's crazy. Uh, and they can just run around because that was a problem in ninth edition for custodians. They couldn't advance and shoot anything. All their guns were rapid fire one. It was terrible. Now your guns can have essentially 36 inch threat range with 24 inch guns plus 12 inch move if you advance six inches. Nice. So the guard makes sense. I mean, just in custodians in general, obviously a good faction to attempt this play style with. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, like you're not even playing the fastest of stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. You're deploying online, and your strategy is to. And maybe I'm misunderstanding the strategy. My understanding of it is that your strategy is to walk up to the middle of the board, stand on the objectives, and just like eat it until your mm -hmm. opponent either tries to come close to you and then charge them, or you, you know, the game ends and you're still standing on the objectives scoring points. If mm -hmm. someone brings the lethality to just like wreck your stuff, mm -hmm. like what do you do in that case? It feels like your your strategy literally doesn't work, and then what is your recourse? Um, yeah, so. One one army they can easily do that is Gene Seer Colts, which, to be honest, is a relatively Dune matchup for any Custodes list. Like, you can change your list to make it better with, like, Alaris and such, but that's just very hard. It's kind of just... You're setting yourself for, for failure, trying to make them better and making every army worse. But speaking of, like, the other meta armies, like Knights and Eldar and such, that are very heavily shooting and can shoot through walls with Knights and Eldar, for instance, is that the amount of damage that has to go into just a 10-man squad is so astronomical that they can't efficiently focus all three squads. Because a 10-man squad will be minus one damage. A lot of them will have four wounds. They'll have a one-up save because of cover. They'll have a four-up feel no pain from mortals. They have a four-up invul. And that's that's how I uh, overcame a lot of the Eldar matchups is because they overvalue how much damage something like the Wraith Knight and Fire Prisms do. And it takes their whole army to not even kill a whole squad while the rest of my army is going on the flanks moving 10 11 12 inches and charging them turn two turn three at the latest while st stringing out and owning every objective with oc3 and if they stick out their most prevalent pieces like hornets and war walker war walkers uh they just got shot very efficiently from double shooting uh custodians uh, at two damage and that really puts them on the back burner where they can't just do their normal play style, staking out their slightly durable light tanks. Wow, that's awesome. So it sounds to me like you have a very firm understanding and grasp of the meta, which is saying something considering this was the first super major and mm -hmm. this was that has been out for like a month and it's been craziness. There's already been balance updates, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So you're not only building a list that you know, does what you want to do. Just deploy in the line, be bulky, do its thing. Mm -hmm. But you're you're kind of counterbending in a, in a way. And that's mm -hmm. because you're identifying like Eldar players are overvaluing fire prisms and Wraith Knights. If you can see it, I actually got the pleasure of commentating one of your games in the semifinals round where you played against Eldar, which featured fire prisms and a Wraith Knight and 10 Wraith Guard. And mm -hmm. that's like about as offensive as I think you can make an Eldar list into Custodes. Oh, yes. And, yeah, right? like that's the doom, doom case scenario. And you basically just tanked it for five turns through clever mm -hmm. use of your models and stuff. In part two, we're going to get into the specifics of how you actually navigate these matchups on the tabletop. But even identifying on the get-go that your Eldar players are overvaluing Wraith Knights or overvaluing Fire Prisms, like, that's such a hard thing to, to catch because on the surface level, they do seem to be ruining everything and, you know, mm -hmm. breaking the meta wide open. So what is, I guess, how what is your practice regime that allows you to have such a firm grasp on what the meta is and then also identify weak points in your opponent's plans uh yeah i i i'm in the military and i'm a family so i can't play as much as i want to but i i get at least two games a week versus my main players uh my friend alex and his brother really play knights they play t sons uh they play elder sometimes uh and i can get gsc locally uh it's a good spread yeah, I can get pretty much every meta list. And I own many armies, so they can just easily borrow them. So any meta army I can easily play against I want to. And uh, 
we obviously do the what you're supposed to do when you're practicing. We discuss everything. We we talk out how you're supposed to play. All that jazz. All that good practice that you should be doing. Not like you know. Uh, Did you elaborate on that? I think a lot of people might struggle in the like how to practice and get better. It's such an overlooked principle of the game because a lot of people just assume you play the games, but there's yes. a technique to which you practice. When you're practicing, you should not be trying to gotcha your opponent. Like, uh, this is like ninth edition brain. Like, if your opponent's 2.9 inches away from you, you're like, you didn't mean to get heroic. Like, obviously, you're supposed to be more than three inches away. Like, you have those easy discussions. Like, you talk out your turn saying, like, I'm going to move here, and then I'm going to try and kill your rubrics, for instance. And then your, and then your I'm going to say, for instance, my opponent Alex is like, and then I'm going to do this. And then you just talk about how the turn should be going. What is the correct play that you should be doing to get the most efficient? Uh, are you damage? resetting stuff? Or are you yeah. letting crazy dice? Um, you know, like I fail the three inch charge. Let's just say I pass. Are you letting that stuff fly? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like you're not you're not here to just like. Just do crazy stuff that doesn't happen every freak every game. Like that's just like those are anomalies. Like it's funny when it happens, but whatever. Uh, when things are supposed to happen, and this is your game plan you set out, and you're just trying to have a good practice game, like not just like a casual game, you you'll play out the correct uh, mechanisms of the game to see how everything goes correctly. Like, does my five custodians kill Magnus? The answer is yes. Uh, but does it kill it when Magnus fights first? We'll see that. We'll see if I can efficiently save my two CP. If it doesn't, we'll just go back. Right, right. Yeah. So how much of it is actually just like actually playing those games and having practice versus competent players and you guys work together to collaborate those matches? That sounds super tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. How much of it is actually those practice games versus um, surrounding yourself in 40k knowledge, like going online on discords and chatting with people or calling people, whatever your medium is? Oh, yes. Uh, speaking of that, that is how what you said the second point is that is how I actually got like good at 40k is I would uh, obsessively research everything about everything and anything in 40k so I would never get got shit and caught out uh, I spend a lot of my because 40k is the only thing I really like to do I don't really care about video games too much I don't watch too much TV it's really my family in 40k so I spend most of my free time watching streams and videos like you guys are to war or war games live with every tournament uh, researching on all the discord talking to all my friends like uh, some of my close friends like uh, they're called the TNG boys, Tyler Bortel and, and uh, Nick Olson Johnson and Lucas Troller, who is on the uh, starter team for Team USA. We always have a lot of discussions and talks, and we're always talking about our armies and how we play into each other. And it's just a lot of being good at 40K is knowing 40K. So you always can know how everything works into everything, and you can never be caught out. Because being caught out is such an easy way to lose, and you should never let yourself lose that way. Yeah, basically just not losing to the knowledge gap between you and your opponent. For sure. So, essentially, you basically have good 40k fundamentals, you practice the matchups a lot, and mm -hmm. you should stick to your guns on the strategy. And this is one thing I always... I, watching you play in the semifinals and finals, I definitely saw it on the, in how you approach your games. When you're getting pummeled by Eldar Wraith Knights, when you're getting pummeled by your opposing custodians in the finale match where you just took the hell of a turn one, lost half your army, um, mm -hmm. you know, you just kept on pushing through. You continued on with your game plan. You didn't just, like, react at all. Um, of course, there's some level of reaction, but, like, mm -hmm. you continued playing your strategy instead of changing what you're trying to do altogether in the face of, like, insanity damage. Mm -hmm. What gives you that kind of confidence in your plan overall? Uh, yeah, it's because I, I know how good each individual custodian is. Uh, I always have my game plan going from game one, which is, it's pretty, it doesn't usually change. It's just stand in the middle, holding every objective, annihilating all the primary, and then uh, setting myself up for secondaries. Uh, speaking of secondaries, the list does secondaries very well because of those T3 models I brought. So I don't have to worry about my good models, like wasting time in secondaries. But I, I always have my game plan from turn one. I focus on it. And even when stuff hits the fan, like versus Hank, where I lose 19 boys in turn one, it 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 prevails and it lets me uh do what I, I need to do when I what I want to do. Yeah, we'll get into the details of all these games and lists in just a bit mm -hmm. here. I want to focus more on kind of your philosophy with 40k. 
you said you know and you understand how good a custodies mod was, but you also play a bunch of other factions. I want to mm-hmm. talk to you like, holistically about that. So like you play Death Guard in ninth edition. As like, <laughs> that, that is amen to that. You know, what, what is your experience playing Death Guard in ninth from that same uh, style with an army that's not as good at it? Yeah, so I switched to Death Guard. Like, Cassidy's got pummeled with nerf in ninth edition. They stopped being fun after, like, the second one where they lost on the rules. And then at the same time, Death Guard got a bunch of free war gear. I'm like, this is cool. This is the coolest shit ever. So I, I pivoted to 60 to 70 Plague Marines with either Mortarian or Abaddon, depending how I was feeling over the week. And that was right just... they got free war gear for the first time. Yeah, it was, and then, you know, that happened to everyone. But that was the coolest thing to me ever. Because Plague Marines with weapons were cool. But then you, they were like 30 points for a cleaver, and that was a criminal. But then I could... The Death Guard was actually very durable in 9th edition. You were minus one damage, you had armor contempt, you had cover two. Like, nothing... Pretty much nothing at that time could kill 60 Plague Marines. Like, ever. I don't think I ever had a game where I got... I got. I think there was like two or three times I ever got fully tabled. Like, I lost, obviously. I was playing one of the worst armies in the game. Uh, but I never got tabled, almost ever. I always ended the game with like 20 boys left. It was so cool. But that army was, it's very similar to current custodies, just way slower and has no shooting. But it was an army where I deployed on the line. You had to, you couldn't hide 60, 70 plague marines ever. And you just ran at your opponent with either Abaddon, Mortarian, like um, being a very good uh, Carnifex type unit. And then I did the same thing with Tyranids, where I ran like 30 warriors. It was so fun. Obviously, it was very overpowered, but it was very fun to me. Just big beefy boys that hit very hard in melee. That's that's the thing. I don't want just like big beefy boys that don't hit. But plague marines, custodian guard, uh, tyranid warriors. All these things are both durable and very good in melee. So Steve, that's... you've been a top player for a, a while now. I've I've mm-hmm. like seen your name competing at the top tables on the Richard Ziegler, Hardy Games. You know, you've been mm-hmm. a charity giver. You've been a name on the list for a while, and you're you're playing a style. That essentially, from the outlooker's perspective, is pick a data sheet that hits hard in melee, is really durable, and runs across the table in a spammable amount of dudes. And that seems really easy to replicate. And I'm not trying to, to assume that it is easy to replicate, but what makes it different that when you run it compared to like when somebody else tries 60 play range or someone else tries 30, 30 custodians guard? This isn't rocket science out here. You're putting yourself yes. online and driving forward. What is the missing link? Um, it's a lot of things I think was just like game knowledge, like really, like I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but before I started spamming Plague Marines, no one was running Ferryman ever. I'd have never seen that ever until I'm like, this is the first time I started looking at Death Guard rules when Plague Marines got changed. I'm like, this faction looks overpowered and no one ever runs it. Ferryman gave you the 12 inch aura of no charging, no fight first, and that's what caused Plague Marines to actually function. Uh, and then, um, so that's just a game knowledge thing people didn't really understand. Uh, Custodians of Guards obviously doesn't have anything like that. We don't have a bunch of rules like that. But it's just, it's really how, it's positioning and movement is very, very important. And I think that is a very hard skill people can't replicate very t- too easily. People don't really, can't replicate how to do movement very well and how to do threat saturation and threat assessment correctly. So there's a few different ways I like to think about movement in terms of the game. There's the micro level, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of people understand at least that it exists if they don't understand necessarily how to execute it. And this is like your pylons, your consolidates, your charging mm-hmm. down for distance, doing weird stuff. And then there's the macro level, which is so much more important, I feel like, when you're playing with three or four units, because this is essentially mm-hmm. where your three or four units are on the table and what they are doing. Am I holding mm-hmm. the left objective or the right objective? Am I pushing into your opponent's side or am I waiting for a turn? And these kinds of overarching questions really dictate the entire flow of the game. You know, come out from behind the wall or not with my 500-point squad. So what is your decision-making process for that in general? Yeah. So when you're playing an essentially exclusively melee army, which in my opinion is probably one of the hardest armies to play, because you're essentially negating a phase. Before it was two phases, you didn't have psychic either. Um, and you have to think pretty much three or four turns in the future. Like, you have to know where your first custodian guard, guard squad is going to be on turn three on deployment. And you have to, and you have to an- highly anticipate your opponent 
which squad they're going to focus down, which squad they're going to try and kill. Because if you miscalculate and you misplace and misdeploy your models and your opponent actually goes for something you didn't even think about, you might just lose the game in deployment. It, it's very, and it goes with the micro movement, like you said, too, like pylons and consolidates. Like a lot of knowing, trying to be near or within range or on the objectives at all times and or in the next turn or two. That's something you have to think about 24 7. And you have to make sure your opponent isn't doing anything to screw up your objective play. And uh, yeah, such like that. Right. So, what to, I mean, it's a great answer, really. But, like, mm -hmm. how do you determine, like, my unit's going to be here in three or four turns? And even more to the point, how do you make the decision for your opponent with accuracy? You're, he's going to focus on this brick. You know, how do you know that? And what do you do with that information? Yeah, so it goes into the game knowledge. You've got to ex expressively know the meta. You have to know exactly what role each model in your opponent's army does and what they're trying, what is their game plan trying to do from turn one onward. Because if you know this this unit, say I have a relic, I have Ceaseless Hunter, lets me do a free movement. If I know my opponent is scared of that relic, that enhancement, I am I can make a very easy assumption that is probably correct that they're going to try and kill that unit, and I will deploy that unit in a different spot where they can't efficiently kill it, or at the same bracket I will use that unit that I maybe don't care about too much, but they highly care about it as a very good. That is my, it's it's not really a bait because you have to have a unit you know is going to get shot, so that is your distraction unit, and you place that in the correct position and move it in the correct position where you know your opponent will want to kill it or focus it down while your other two, three, four units are relatively more or less safe. Right. So basically, it's almost like you're using one unit to draw so much of your opponent's army out. So the rest of your army can either get into mm -hmm. it or, you know, start navigating at the table around them. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a pretty easy way of thinking about it. So like with with that in mind, I guess you you have to be able to chop off someone's ability to do damage to you after a certain point, and that can be difficult without having guns. And mm -hmm. by that, I mean basically if you lose 500 points of custodians on top of turn one, mm -hmm. you can't do it on turn two and turn three and expect to win this game. That's like unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And given that you don't really shoot back, it's like a play-style philosophy, which I love. Yes. I appreciate <laughs> lack of guns. You know, I'm a movement guy myself. Um, how do you deal with the fact that you don't shoot? That seems like a pretty big hill to overcome. It's really down to mental. Like some, a lot of players, I love, especially obviously a lot of uh, casual players, that's, that's no offense to them or anything, can get overwhelmed and like disheartened when they start losing models. That's not something you can do as a melee army. You just have to know X amount of boys are going to die and they did their purpose. Um, and you got to, just, like I said before, you just got to know what their guns are going to do and how much damage they can do, how much damage they might think they'll do, but not actually do with your stuff, your your bonuses, like your strats and your defensive abilities. And at the same time, you have to understand your opponent is also getting overwhelmed when they are holding zero one objectives and you're holding four or five, and there's not too much they can do about it because they can't really charge a custodian because custodian is the anti melee army in the game. So it's like you're basically sacrificing your army for objectives and tempo. You know, it, I'll lose 50% of my army, but I'm on four out of five objectives. And if I do that for three turns, you can't catch back up on the scoreboard. 100%. That's a, that's a very, it takes a certain kind of guy to take 40K and approach it that way. I mean, like, you like losing all your toys. How does that work? <laughs> uh, it's fine. As long as they did their job. Uh they took their damage, they killed a boy, they held an objective, they did a secondary. Is this like, your military it's... background coming in? The <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Um, but it's just, it's fine. They just did their job. As long as I get one boy in the melee and hit someone, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fine with that. What happens if you are, like, you know, custodians are, like, the best example of this. What if you just roll back? You know, like, I was supposed mm -hmm. to lose this many shit guys to last cannons, but, oh, God, I couldn't pass a four to save my life. Like, is that just a chalk it up to an L, or... Do you come yeah, back? that's that's what happened versus Hank, where I lost 19 custodians in turn one. Most games, that's I don't right. even I don't even lose 19 custodians in the whole game. So I'm <laughs> like, because that was exactly what Hank needed, and I was like, all right, how do I come back from this? 
all right, I have this relic that lets me fall back tune charge. I can use that to now do the job they weren't thinking of doing, which was running around. So now I can do secondaries easily. I can steal primary because I'm still OC 30 on a 10-man squad. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, and then I have all these extra squads who are easily doing secondaries. So even if the, the worst comes to worst uh, versus 99% of armies, Gene Star Colts not included, um, I just have to focus on game plan number two, which is maybe I'm not going to kill you, which doesn't usually happen, but maybe I'm not going to kill you, but I can steal all your crap. Interesting. So you actually turn to like a mission play army as a default if you get hit too hard, because I guess your army gets smaller and easier to hide and harder to shoot. Oh, yes. That's, that's actually what happened. <laughs> what happened in a lot of games. That's funny. All right, Steve, why don't we actually unpack what this army is um, mm -hmm. that you took to the Tacoma finale and uh, brought home a ticket to the Atlanta finals? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, my list, I brought uh, Trajan, two shield captains with spears. One had the Ceaseless Hunter enhancement, which is which was clutch. It was so good. I had that at the last minute. It is... Uh, Always fall back, shoot, and charge, which is insane. That seems great. And yeah, once per game, if someone moves within nine of you, you get to make a normal move up to six inches. Just normal move of six inches in any direction. Yeah, that's, so, what do you mean? This, this, this is amazing. Yeah, so someone like phantasms you doesn't get enough inches away. Uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're getting charged. You're dying. Um, ambiguously, I, I don't, actually, I'm not going to go into ambiguous things. That's not good. So, uh, But just... Or someone just moves near you, tries to move block one of your other squads. Like that happened in Hank, where he tried to go for my other guard squad, and I could just move around. It's just a lot of play. Or you could let you efficiently use heroic intervention, uh, so you can heroic intervene someone, punch them, and then fall back and shoot and still charge and make a very long slingshot. Which slingshots are kind of hard to do in tenth edition. They've nerfed the heck out of uh, charging, but uh, this this helps a lot with that aspect. And that's my characters. But Oh, and I have a Calvus Assassin, which has the uh, Vect ability, the plus one CP for us the game. And the main reason I brought the Calvus Assassin was she, every turn, she can go back to reserve and come back the next turn. So every turn, she can do some kind of secondary. And she's a lone operative. So she's just, she's just nuts. And then onto the rest of my list, I have three identical Custodian Guard squads with uh, eight spears, one Vexilla, which makes them OC3, and a shield. And then one guy with a shield and a sword. So I have two two shields and eight spears. And then uh, finally, I have two squads of five RBT's exactors, which are just one of the most insane uh, Imperium units. They have a four up save, so three up in cover. They have a five up feel no pain. They have some free good guns for no reason. And they have all have assault guns, so they can advance and do quote unquote actions, which is just so good. And then my last unit is just a squad of sisters, just as like a a ghetto version of the exactors. Why not just take two exaction squads? I did take two. Or a third one. I can't. You can only oh. take two, sadly. Yeah, yeah, you can only take two characters and two non-characters for Imperial Agents. Awesome. So just looking at it, it's three big bricks. I'm assuming a character joins each one. And exactly. then it's mission play nonsense. Mm -hmm. I'm so eager to unpack this. I mean... Mm -hmm. All of my instincts tell me to take more small squads, Wardens, Alaris. They all have different strengths and weaknesses. Yes. Caladius, I know you played against Caladius in the finals, so that's going to be yeah. super exciting to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of your army versus Hanks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you yourself said you tested every data sheet in this codex multiple times. Yes. And to arrive at three of the same mm -hmm. data sheet, and that is it. I think that is that is fascinating. So we're going to unpack that in part two, everybody. You can check mm -hmm. that out on AOW40K.com. You'll not only get access to the second half of this conversation, but we're going to unpack the hows, the whys, the what he does with this army on the tabletop, and why you need to be aware of custodies as they are <laughs> proving themselves to be one of the strongest armies in the game. But you'll also get access to all the other episodes along with our amazing Discord server. So we will see you over there. If you're not going to join us, that's okay. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and we will be back next week with yet another show.